Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Al Richmond, Executive Director of Community Campus Partnerships for Health, based in Research Triangle Park, North Carolina. Welcome to this webinar session that highlights our organization's commitment to health equity and social justice. Today's session will focus on improving African immigrant health. It's part of an ongoing series, actually part two, of a series that we have um, been coordinating with the minority um, AIDS Coalition of New England, a photo voice examining the impact of COVID-19 on African immigrants living in the New England region of the US. Again, welcome. In terms of background information, we want to share with you that African immigrants have been uniquely affected by the coronavirus crisis. Social, cultural, and systemic factors place African immigrants at greater risk of both acquiring coronavirus and experiencing severe symptoms or death related to COVID-19. However, to date, information is not being systematically collected and translated to support the real-time developments of effective, culturally and linguistically appropriate COVID-19 interventions. Saudi is a photo voice project conducted to document challenges experienced by African immigrants during the pandemic and capture effective coping and support mechanisms used by African immigrants living in the New England region of the US. This webinar will present recommendations for healthcare providers and researchers to improve African immigrants engagement in COVID-19 prevention, treatment and care. I'm excited today to have at least three um, uh, panelists to join us today and presenters um, who will uh, share with us really some exciting information about their work, their experiences, and even their discovery. Um, our first speaker is Chiomi Naji. Uh, Chiomi, I will acknowledge, is a CCPH board member and has been uh, for a number of years. So we welcome her in her dual role as a board member but also as Senior Program Director of the Multicultural AIDS Coalition in Boston, where she leads work in research capacity building trainings and community mobilization. Specifically, she founded and currently directs the Africans for Improved Access program, which is an HIV STI outreach, screening and navigation program engaging black immigrants in Massachusetts. Her ongoing organizing with African immigrant communities has established her as a national voice and stake, stakeholder advocating for the community and well-represented efforts in service delivery, research, and civic engagement. I want to acknowledge that Chioma is also currently a PhD student at the University of Boston School for Global Inclusion and Social Development, and is currently a fellow with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Culture of Health Leaders Program. Our next speaker will be Agatha Adigwe. And Agatha is an African immigrant from Nigeria and a public health professional in the nonprofit space. Currently, she facilitates capacity building training and coordinates regional and national collaborative research projects on African immigrant health as program coordinator at the Multicultural AIDS Coalition in Boston. Um, at this time, I will turn it over to uh, our first speaker, Chiomi Naji. 
Hello, good afternoon, good morning, everyone. Um, I do want to also acknowledge that we have a third speaker who will be joining us today, Enza Utara, um, who is the State Refugee Health Coordinator at the Office of Maine Refugee Services, Catholic Charities, Maine. Um, so you will hear from all three of us today. We are excited to present this um, uh, project. We're excited to be collaborating with CCPH, who has really started thinking about what does it mean to do community partnerships as it relates to um, immigrants and has partnered with us specifically focused on African immigrants. So we welcome everybody and look forward to the Q&A and discussion that will happen later on um, with our time together. So I will give a brief overview of our project um, and then my colleague Agatha uh, will give you a um, more details about our methodology and our analysis and then um, my colleague Enza will get let you know what our outcomes are. Um, so again my name is Chioma Naji. I'm a, pro a program director at the Multicultural AIDS Coalition. This project is funded by uh, PCORI um, and so we want to acknowledge that our uh, award number is 17466-MAC. So some of you might be asking questions about who is PCORI. Um, the PCORI stands for Patient Center Outcomes Research Institute. Um, I want to take some time to talk a little bit about PCORI and what PCORI stands for, not only because they're our funder, but also because I know that this is a group that's committed to engaging community, engaging partners, and engaging um, community partners, community members, um, and other stakeholders. And I think that this is a viable funding source for individuals who are committed to that work, um, who are committed to building research um, literacy, um, particularly patient-centered research literacy in our communities. So PCORI focuses on ensuring that people are able to make informed health decisions um, that uh, really benefit their overall um, health and improve their, their overall um, utilization of health services, clinical services. Um, PCORI has basically about five focus areas and these focus areas are also the, the areas in which they provide funding, right? Um, and so they have an engagement um, portfolio, um, which they call their engagement awards. They have a portfolio around methodologies, a portfolio around um, um, research and particularly research that focuses on comparative effectiveness research. Um, then they have a portfolio all around dissemination and, and implementation. Um, and we were fortunate to be funded under their portfolio, their portfolio around engagement. And so their portfolio around engagement focuses on engaging patients, caregivers, and all other stakeholders in our entire research process from topic generation gen, generation to dissemination and implementation, implementation of results. And so I'm sure those of you who are with us today can draw the, the, the similarities between PCORI's focus around patient-centered um, outcomes and engagement um, with uh, community-based participatory research or community-engaged research, which is again why I think this is a viable um, funding source for people to look at. And here's a little bit more information about our the engagement awards um, program framework. Um, and so you'll see that the engagement awards has three program areas. One is capacity building. Two is dissemination. If you remember, I said they have a focus on dissemination and really ensuring that uh, the projects that have been funded through BCORI, the research, the evidence-based projects, that the findings are disseminated not only to service providers or healthcare providers, but also that they are tangible, um, friendly uh, uh, documents that are developed so that patients can use them to make informed decisions. And then the last one is really focused on stakeholder convening support, right? So creating opportunities where you can convene different stakeholders, including patients, um, to engage in conversations around patient-centered um, outcomes research or um, 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 CER, which is their uh, um, main way of, uh, of research. Um, so if you want more information, um, I saw someone put in the chat PCORI's website, please go and find more information. CCPH is a resource to find um, information um, more about PCORI and so utilize CCPH also. 
So now getting to our project. Um, so our project um, is a pro is focused on uh, or includes um, individuals from across the New England region. Um, and so you'll see um, the, pro the partners uh, on the slide. And I wanna acknowledge that we really have a diverse group of partners. We have um, partners that rep represent community-based organizations uh, that particularly for, provide services to refugees or immigrants, African immigrants. We have partners who um, are part of the resettlement, the state um, funded resettlement programming. Um, and so they sit at the state at state agencies, um, ensuring that um, uh, refugees are being um, integrated and resettled within our various communities. And then we also have academic partner, the University of Vermont. Um, so we're even very excited about the way that we'll be able, we were able to put, put forth these various stakeholders that are working with our patient population, which is African immigrant health. And I want to acknowledge that one of the things about PCOR is they want to make sure that patients, who they call patients or who we call community members, are engaged in the process. And so that means being part of the leadership team. And that could be also advocacy organizations or other organizations that represent patients. In our partnership, we have one, two, uh, three uh, organizations that particularly represent uh, our patient population, which is African immigrants. Next slide, please. So why uh, are we doing this project? And Al pretty much gave a very good opening around why this project was critical for us to do. Um, our project is focused on the impact of COVID-19 on African immigrants living in New England. What we realized as all the information was coming out about COVID-19 is that the numbers happening within our African immigrant community were not being reported on. Um, we, there, were, there were not conversations about the impact of COVID-19 on this community. And what we do know is that too often uh, what is happening in the African community is lumped under um, the racial category of Black slash African, um, Black slash African Americans. And there are some similarities, of course, but there are differences um, that make it more important for us to really specifically focus on African immigrants. Um, and so in our various um, states across New England, uh, we knew that African immigrants were um, at greater risk around um, acquiring COVID-19 and experiencing symptoms uh, because one of the reasons is because our communities are the ones that you might see in frontline sort of um, jobs, right? Whether that is, you know, within our hospital settings or whether that's within our nursing homes as CNAs or even um, within our our cleaning, our janitorial staff. These are individuals who tend to be in frontline um, positions within our organizations and within our communities. Even in Boston, we have a lot of African immigrants and Black immigrants who are uh, uh, the ones driving our buses, right, and doing and running our trains. Um, and so really keeping in mind, what are the high contact jobs? Um, because they, those are the, uh, the jobs that we know are going to be at higher risk. And then we also saw in our local communities that there was a lack of information around COVID-19 that is culturally and linguistically appropriate. And so when we talk about linguistically appropriate, we don't mean word for word translation. Um, what we mean is even sort of concepts around that integrate um, the understandings of African immigrants as it relates to disease and health, right? And so how do we make sure that people are receiving information in a way in which they are traditionally or organically um, uh, sharing and learning information. And then not just African immigrants, but across all immigrant communities, we, we knew, know that there's a fear um, in accessing COVID-19 services, whether it's testing or vaccine, vaccines are now the booster because of the anti-immigration um, uh, sentiment that has been th happening um, throughout the U.S. history, but particularly within the past administration and now with the current administration and what's happening um, on the borders um, with our um, Haitian immigrant brothers and sisters. Um, and then lastly, what we saw was that uh, there were a lot of mental health challenges um, that people were dealing with because African immigrants tend to be a very communal um, uh, community um, where they they really uh, base a lot of their interactions on uh, you know their relationships with their families and their relationships with their um, communities, and so what we saw was that the the inability to practice some of the cultural and religious practices um, had a huge mental um, impact on them, mental and emotional, and it was not just about 
um, not being able to connect with family, but was about not being able to be in spaces where they're able to uh, continue to practice their culture and religious, religious beliefs. And we saw this as it relates to um, Eid, when Eid was happening, we saw this as it relates to when people were dying and there were traditional cultural ceremonies that happened and people were not able to gather and mourn together. Next, next slide, please. Um, so now I'm going to turn it over to Agatha, who's our um, pro program coordinator. Okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Chama. So I'll be taking us through the program's process, as well as the results generated from the study. Um, to implement this program, we had used a different strategies ranging from our partnership development. During the course of our project, we partners or partners in the states decentralized or had decentralized power. This ensured that they were able to be flexible and adaptable to the situations that present in the states because um, with the pandemic, different states had different guidelines and different mandates. So this helped us to be able to implement more um, more flexibly the program activities. We also had a good team design in the sense that instead of just working with just the partners, which had um, about one member on the team, we also recruited the help of community health workers from each of the states. Some states had more than one, so now that um, accommodate for like language needs and session, session times and availability. So with the help of the community health workers, we were able to stay in constant contact with our participants as they went into the field to take this, the photos. And then in case they also experienced or had any other problems or issues, they also had easy access to the community health workers who brought it to the leadership team. The team also had multiple training and support programs. Um, before the start of the project, we had received training on photo voice using the photo voice consultant. Um, we had gotten training on facilitation and even conducting research because um, for majority of our community health workers, this was their first time engaging in research, especially a photo voice research. So that was really good. We had also as a team in conjunction with the community health workers developed a workbook. So this workbook was used for the different sessions. We had three sessions of photo voice and each session had its own workbook, which laid out all the activities each session is supposed to have or is supposed to do. Um, and because, as I said initially, this is a relatively new research methodology for most of our team members, we had also had continuous support and training in terms of um, having practice sessions, right? So before each session starts, we kind of meet together to go through the workbook and then the facilitators who are the community health workers practice how to actually do those activities so that it, they get used to it and get more comfortable doing them. The session was also designed in such a way that it was able to be flexible to participants' needs. Um, we had teams in states that had about two groups. This way, we were able to have a group that speak just a particular language, whether English, Swahili, Kenya, Rwanda, because those were our majority or those were the majority of our participants. Um, we had groups that were able to meet in person or online or hybrid. Um, we saw this hybrid method pop up more during the second wave of the pandemic when some states had to also shut down because of the increased numbers. So um, for example, our team in Vermont had had to move their in-person session because they had to, they had a hybrid, and they had a virtual and they had an in-person. But the in-person had to move virtual for the third session because Vermont had shut down during the second wave of the pandemic. And so we saw that community health workers in um, addition to the community-based organizations they were working with, had to now run around, you know, get um, access to smartphones, laptops, tablets for their participants so they could complete their final photo voice session. Um, it also enabled us to, to provide interpretation services for these different groups. And then um, they had to do it at different times. Some states did theirs every week. Some states had a break in between so they could also um, take more pictures and then come up. So this variety in structure also helped with the implementation of the full voice sessions. So what is photo voice? 
Simply put, photo voice is a participatory, which is the emphasis actually of this methodology, a participatory research method that individuals use to represent their experiences, their opinions, points of views using photos and narratives. Some people use videos, but anything that gives you both a visual and the written part of the experience. Our goal for this project had been to provide recommendations to researchers, providers, and healthcare systems in general for engaging African immigrants in COVID-19 intervention. And to do this, we had documented challenges um, African immigrants faced related to the COVID-19 pandemic and also documented successful strategies that they had used to cope during that time. In order for participants to go into the field to take pictures, we had given them a few guidelines, right, to help keep them safe and to make sure that the pictures too they are taking are relevant to the objectives of the study. So as a team, we had come up with framing questions that we shared with participants so they could keep at the back of their mind as they took their photos or as they looked around their you know, environment to decide what photos to take. Um, the questions had included, um, what was hard for you and or your family during the COVID-19 pandemic? What is your experience accessing COVID-19 testing and seeking care? What is your experience accessing other healthcare services during the pandemic? Where do you get your information about COVID-19, right? Because we wanted to know who their trusted fault um, source is as, their, as compared to the available source of information as well. And then how are you addressing or being supported through your challenges during the pandemic? So during the first session, we had collected basic demographic information about our participants. We found that majority of them are from the um, Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, majority of them were between ages 18 and 45. Over 75% of them were female. 60% of them are parents with an average of four children. 35% are refugees, 22% permanent residents, and 25% US citizens. And 25% um, of them had no formal education and weren't currently enrolled in school. They also reported experiences of COVID-19. So um, some of them, or most of them reported having access to COVID-19 services, such as food assistance, unemployment benefits, COVID-19 testing, cash assistance, and rental assistance, and reported mental health impacts too, such as anger, depression, fear, and anxiety. So we saw that also 14% had tested positive for COVID-19, and 7% experienced symptoms, but they did not access care. 30% of them had also lost their jobs due to the pandemic. So in the end, um, the project, the photo voice session itself started between October and November. It was a six weeks project for those sessions. So we convened all nine photo voice groups across the New England region. Um, all states completed the three photo voice sessions um, successfully. Each state had at least one community health worker, but in total we had nine because some states had two to accommodate for participants' needs. Um, we had started with 118 participants thereabouts and ended up with 103 completing all three sessions. Um, there were some dropouts along the way due to certain situations that we couldn't prevent. Each state had about six to eight teams per category Participants offered 44 recommendations for analysis. We had 57 photo stories at the end and 16 teams were identified. Um, the, teams were in, or the teams include both the challenges and the strategies as well. We also had held a town hall which had 73 attendees and the attendees ranged from um, community members to other stakeholders, you know, researchers, public health professionals, healthcare providers, um, different administrators or state department officials. And in the end, we came up with 15 recommendations. So the themes for the challenges, participants across all states reported feelings of loneliness and isolation, restrictive movement, life changes in the new normal, experiencing loss, whether financial or the deaths in family, friends, loved ones. System challenges, fear of the unknown, difficulties for children, and overall stress. For the strategies, teams identified were having hope and staying positive, adhering to government guidelines and assistance, exercising traditional home remedies, 
communications and information gathering, faith, and then maintain connections to their friends, their families, and information as well. So we have all these photo stories on our website. Please feel free to you know, take your time, look through the website and leave as much comment and feedback as you like, and we do respond to the feedback. But for now, we'll share with you a photo, um, how do I put this? A video, yes, of the photo stories so that it gives you an idea of all that the participants were able to do. Okay, it's taking its time to load.
Gioma and team, this is amazing. I, I wonder if we might take a moment to ask people to chat in the chat box because people were so focused on the, um, the video. What words come to mind as you think about the images that you saw? We would love to hear from you. So if you would take a moment to just in the chat box to um, share your thoughts and feelings because I feel like this has you know evoked so much um, powerful images of people. Kenya says it's powerful, more telling than I would have thought by the images. Um, another person says, amazing work. Roxanne talks about resilience. Um, others say, I'd love to share ideas with you um, about this work. Others, we'd love to hear from you. The, the work community, Comfort says, the work community came up in her. Others. Thank you. We just wanted to give people a moment to kind of uh, think about what they're feeling and share that in this virtual space. Um, inclusion, connecting to family and faith despite barriers. Um, Angela says, hope. As an artist, it's so important to see. Another person says, as an artist, it's so important to see and feel people's uh, lives and impact of COVID. Very powerful. Um, support and hope. Yes, thank you. Uh, incur and continue to do uh, to share encouragement is another word that 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 someone wants to share with us. Chioma, I'll also pass it over to you at this time, but I wanted to give way for that. Just so relatable, seeing yourself and your experiences in their photos. Thank you, Zion. Thank you, Al, for creating that that space to reflect. Um, some sometimes we get so into the work and trying to get to how do we apply or think about our findings that we don't take time to sort of just pause and realize the impact that it has on us personally um and you know definitely the impact that it has on people that we love and care about so i appreciate that yeah, and it I think about like these the, the images were so powerful geoma that you know they could almost be traumatic for some people and in this moment it's hard for us to recall what was occurring a year ago yes mm -hmm. Um, and thank you, thank you for that. Um, and I think it reaffirms the work that we need to do. Um, I see a lot of folks on this call um, that I know and who are doing the work in their local communities with African immigrants. So for us to just be reaffirmed that what we're doing is needed and that we need to keep pushing the needle to make sure our communities are being cared for and are able to, to live well while they're, while they're here in the US. So I think next will be Enza. Am I correct? Um, who will uh, be sharing um, sort of what are our recommendations? Um, and please, again, folks, take the opportunity to give us feedback because this is uh, living work, right? So it's it's not finalized, but we want folks feed, uh, feedback. And Inza, Inza, if you can just take a moment to introduce yourself too. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Choma. Um, I'm sorry for the few minute delay when I was trying to log in for technical reason I was late. And um, okay, but I believe I didn't miss a lot. So uh, thank you very much uh, for giving me the opportunity today to speak on our project. Uh, my name is Enza Watarara and I'm the state refugee health coordinator from the state of Maine. I am one of the partners of the six New England state that uh, conducted this project, this photo voice project. And uh, it was a pleasure for me to participate in this. It was an honor as well to participate in this project because it was uh, touching a very particular population that we seem to ignore whenever we are working with uh, immigrant population. So um, today I'm going to be uh, talking about the recommendations that came out of this uh, project. And uh, when, uh, Agata was doing her presentation. She said, uh, you know, we have had about 44 recommendations in total from all the six New England states. But then we have to group them in things to come up with about 15 to 17. And I will tell you that we are still working on this recommendation. We are trying to finalize them. And uh, they are very uh, lengthy. And that explained probably uh, the importance of the problems that the African immigrant have been facing with the COVID-19. Choma mentioned few of those uh, when she was doing her introduction, 
the fact that they are occupying work positions that uh, expose them more than other demographics. The fact that they live in larger families that, you know, uh, I mean, that, that contribute to exposing them more and in crowded quarters as well. So um, the 44 recommendation was shrinked and they were grouped as this image is showing. And uh, we came up with at least 15 to 17 that I'm gonna go through. So um, one of the recommendations, one of the most important one is to examine the use and importance of the traditional African remedies. Because during the research or during the project, many uh, community African immigrant community members talk about home remedies. And that is true as an individual, you know, from the Afri an African background as well. I personally know that we use a lot of uh, bowel medicine in Africa before coming, before migrating to the United States. And sometimes there are some uh, illnesses or some uh, uh, disease that we experience here. And we strongly believe that, you know, you know, calling a brother, a family member from home to send us some, you know, of the medicine that we've been used to treating those medicines will be helpful and better than even going to the emergency room or to see your primary care physician. So that came a lot. So for example, people talk about use, using ginger, lime, lemon, garlic, black seed. You've seen uh, and some example in the photo and the photos that pass around. So uh, we thought maybe examining that, you know, and uh, this recommendation probably go to some uh, researchers you know in the field to kind of look at that and see you know what does those uh, items uh, used by african immigrants have you know that help them you know uh, deal with the pandemic next so another recommendation was leveraging the relationship with trusted african faith based organizations so we also discovered that you know african immigrant you know, uh, uh, or, you know, their religion is uh, critical in, you know, their, uh, the African immigrants' life. And uh, most of them go to churches and mosques. So we thought, you know, and, and also most of them believe uh, and they trust, you know, uh, their faith-based leaders. So we thought that maybe uh, policymakers or healthcare providers or even uh, government could probably use that avenue to access this population in trying to fight the pandemic among them. So that was another recommendation that was well, I mean, that came up a lot because uh, many of the people like to listen to their pastors, even during the pandemic when uh, there was uh, no way of going to church, people were still creating congregation, you know, uh, virtual congregation on WhatsApp and Facebook to still see their uh, congregation member and talk to their pastors or their imams. Next. So establish a community-driven support system for youth. Uh, you could have seen that, you know, um, most of the African immigrant uh, parents, you know, had, you know, problems homeschooling their kids. And uh, we thought, you know, trying to create a community driven support system around those i mean around uh, the african immigrant community members would help solve that problem for example so even conduct even for example we believe that to do that one way to do that is to fund a local organization to conduct assessment with the african immigrant youth and respond comprehensively to problem that those uh, category of uh, immigrant african immigrant may face so next So other recommendations have been uh, leveraging, I mean, we did that uh, commit, uh, the commit to the inclusion of African immigrants in all aspects of research and healthcare system. You know, there are a lot of models that are being used in the healthcare system that maybe African immigrants do not recognize with. So we believe that, you know, uh, trying to include some African immigrants in all aspects of healthcare research for the healthcare system will be also uh, important here to, to consider. Promote culturally and linguistically appropriate approach to address mental health and emotional health. 
they were, we, you could have seen in the data as well, in the data that Agatha presented, some, uh, some of the participants reported mental health issues such as depression and anxieties. But unfortunately, we did not have you know, uh, the power or we did not prepare you know, to refer anybody for any, for any mental health issue, even though we were, you know, uh, we came across people that reported that. So that just stayed like that. But we believe that uh, states organizations, uh, system, healthcare system could promote some cultural and linguistic appropriate approach to dealing with mental health and emotional health uh, during the pandemic. Can you, is that, okay, yeah. So integrate cultural practice into the healthcare system. That comes a lot. And uh, implement comprehensive language access plan, including, uh, including, sorry, including African dialects. Sometimes, you know, um, people uh, or healthcare providers, you know, will, uh, think about interpretations, you know, in the healthcare setting without thinking about the dialect. You know, sometimes you may come and somebody will, uh, they will ask you about, I mean, some people were reporting that, you know, you are being asked about your first language. And when you say uh, French, for example, they wouldn't even think about if that, that depending on where you are coming from, the French you may be speaking may be different from somebody coming from Quebec, for example, or from Canada, for example, or from France. So they will just find somebody even on the phone that can speak French. But sometimes you may, you said French, but you may not understand very well what people are saying. So considering dialect and considering uh, the country of origin the person is coming from to establish that interpretation uh, connection or to provide that resource is very important. And uh, creating a safe and healthy work environment. Some people didn't feel safe to even take a day out of work because they believe that if they take a day or two out of work, their boss may you know, fire them. And uh, people were not aware of the fact that some organization and company were having federal government money to even allow employees to take two weeks paid leave as related to COVID. So they were not safe, you know, they did not know what to do and they kept going to work and getting exposed. So building research and health literacy of African immigrants, I think, I believe that our work is a beginning to that, you know, and uh, I could see in the chat that some people are now getting interested in what we are doing. So that's very uh, interesting and identify and reduce area of financial threat for African immigrant families. You know, uh, some people reported that, you know, uh, during this uh, 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 project that, you know, sometimes uh, uh, help were in a form that was not quite appropriate to the need they were, they were having. Some people were even bold to say that, well, we would have loved, you know, the government to just give us the money and we will go ahead and get what we need to cope with the uh, pandemic. So um, that's where this recommendation may be stemming from. And support infrastructure for self-sufficiency and community cohesion. These are all you know, policy and decision-making uh, uh, recommendations for states and organizations. And then the last but not the least was listen. So people didn't feel heard, especially in the state of Maine, where I'm coming from, ethnic community-based organization saw this disproportionate impact on African immigrant coming or African American in general. They saw this ethnic community-based organization in Maine saw this coming earlier than the government, earlier than the, uh, the Department of Health and Human Services. And they have been meeting at the earlier stage of the pandemic, finding solution to help their communities before, and they were talking to the government about it and they were not being listened because of the structure. I mean, the structure is such that the government cannot just provide you know, assistance or grant to small organizations that are not equipped to manage those grants. So they were not being listened, but they were doing their own thing to help their community members. And then later on, 
you all on this call may be aware that Maine were one of the worst states in terms of disproportionate impact of COVID on, you know, uh, on the minorities and by population. So listening to what the community members or organization that are connected with the community directly are saying is very important. So I think that ends the recommendations that we, uh, we are still working on and uh, that will conclude this project. Thank you for listening. Thank you. So we just want to reiterate that folks can, um, I see a couple of questions in the chat about access to this. So we will send out the recording. You will have access to this presentation. You can also go on our website, uh, www.africanimmigranthealth.org. Um, and our, the videos are available there. So the video of the photo voice stories that we just saw uh, the actual images are on our website and also you'll be able to get a glimpse of our town hall meeting so uh, what we brief briefly went over is that after we completed our project we actually had a town hall meeting um, with uh, stakeholders across uh, the new, new england and that was very fruitful in a lot of ways um, where we thought we were going in to say okay we would like to get more uh, uh, a response from the challenges and strategies that we're presenting. But what we realized was that there's still a huge gap of knowledge around COVID-19. So a good part of that webinar at the end during our discussion was about educating our community members who joined us, our African community members who joined us, educating them about COVID-19. And I think that was an eye opener for us in terms of uh, the lack of information are reiterated, I guess, our findings in terms of the lack of information that is out there. And again, it's not just like a word for word understanding, it's a concept understanding um, that I think that we lose because we think that we can say, okay, how do you say about us in uh, Luganda, right, which is a language in Uganda, right? But really, we need to think about what are we trying to relay um, to the community about this, this uh, about COVID-19, what we're talking about, but in general, what are we trying to relay and what is the best way to do that? Because it might not be a flyer or a pamphlet, it might actually be a video that we need to use. Um, and so uh, definitely go to our website uh, and you'll be able to get access to all this. But after this, I think CC CCPH will be sending out a re this recording and I will hand it back over to Al. Hey, thank you so much. What a powerful um, experience we've had this today with listening to you and your sharing. And I think the images continue to resonate deeply with all of us. Um, I have a lot of questions for you. And I know others have questions as well. Um, you know, I think that one of the things I really feel today, and, 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 and so let me welcome you officially to the call. Um, I had an opportunity to meet you. I think, I guess it was last year. It seems so long ago now uh, and welcome to this. And so uh, didn't want to oversight uh, to overlook you, but we're just so glad to have you today. We were just kind of moving so fast that I didn't acknowledge you at the, uh, at the top of the call. One of the things that I sense from this today is this desire. People are asking about exchanging contact information and 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 all of that. And I wonder is that something? Uh, I'll, I'll direct this specifically to Chioma uh, that y'all have been thinking about or uh, about kind of creating this network uh, because there seems to be like a almost a, a desire to have a clearinghouse, if you will, of resources and information. Can people find that um, on your website or is that something that you all are actively engaged in? Yeah, so there's a couple of things that I would say um, that align with, with that. Is one on our website, we, st we have started to curate our catalog articles that are specific to African immigrants from 2000, 2000 right, Agatha, um, to present. Um, and so just for it to be a clearinghouse, we have, you know, information, we have articles that have been published across all 
um, health issues. Um, and so if you have an article that you have published and it's not on there, email it to us. Um, we will definitely post it up there. Um, because again, this is a new community um, and there isn't much out there. So we created one space online in which we could at least start cataloging um, and collecting information that is out there. That's one thing. The other thing is that we talk about ourselves as a collaborative, the African Immigrant Health Collaborative. Um, and the partnership has the ability to grow, right? And really think about how can we create, like you said, Al, a network of people, researchers, healthcare providers, community members who are really committed to doing work around African immigrant health. So we encourage you please to go ahead and sign up on our mailing list. Um, we are thinking through what, it, what does it look like? What does it mean? There's opportunities for us to put together um, a, um, a gathering, a convening around that topic. Um, and so if folks are really interested in that, please connect with us. Um, and this is about us coming together and thinking about the best way to do it, right? It's not just this partnership, but us as a collective doing this work to really come together and think about how do we move this work forward? I wonder also, um, you know, this work is so powerful um, and there's so much emotion in it. I wonder, uh, and I just open this up to all of you all, um, you know, we're, we're talking about individuals who have seen a lot and have experienced a lot in their lives. Um, you know, some people having seen war firsthand and, and even uh, pandemics in their country and similar kinds of health uh, crises. Uh, how was this traumatizing for you, but also for some of the people that were participating in this work. Um, and so what, do you, what did, were you feeling any of that? Or did you hear some of that kind of being um, shared in the work that you all were doing? Um, actually, as a team, uh, I mean, as a team member, we, I did not quite participate, you know, uh, didn't have the direct contact with uh, the participant uh, for a, quite for a long period of time. I, mm -hmm. I attended one uh, uh, one session, you know, of uh, uh, the Zoom meeting that we're having. And during that session, um, some reported, you know, as I said, and as we, and, and, and and as the data indicated, some reported some signs of you know uh, mental health issues like. Uh, isolation and loneliness and anxieties. They did not present it there, but they reported it that they how that's how they felt. And uh, so that really happened. And uh, personally, it was like a general uh, uh, feeling for me because we all were, you know, since this thing started with the Zoom activities, personally, I believe maybe some in this will, uh, will uh, um, identify with me, I had that feeling too at some point, you know, the Zoom effect always home, always Zooming from home, you know, that loneliness, uh, that isolation, that was a feeling that we had. And so it's like um, we were all impacted the same way and uh, the person reported it. And uh, again, we didn't uh, uh, go deeper in asking questions or we didn't probe to, you know, to, to have a lot of uh, discussion. Yeah, at least here in Maine, I don't know if uh, Agada who participated in other session, you know, can uh, give you more information. Agatha, I see your hand up. <laughs> you. Thank you, Ezra. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Inza. Thank you, Al. Um, so I should just add to what Mr. Inza explained. So um, the community health workers had most of the interaction with the participants, but um, I was fortunate enough to attend some of those sessions um, in Vermont and in Rhode Island. And um, from your question or for your question around the isolation and the loneliness, and I would really say it did, yeah, like it hit pretty hard. Um, for some of the sessions I attended, you could see the emotions as people explained or um, talked about their experiences. And um, one woman in particular, this was in, this was in Vermont, because um, they have this organization, this community-based organization that they are, they are really close to. They go there for different services um, and not limited to just maybe um, things, um, social support. So they have those, the center um, helps them with like immigration services, interpretation, hospital appointments, like all of that. So the center had to close down, right? Because of the pandemic. And you could see how she was, she was just talking about how that has really affected her. 
that she couldn't come to even see people, just to come out and see people and talk to people. And that when she had the um, COVID-19, when she tested positive for COVID-19, nobody could come to visit her, which was really sad because it was just her and her family. Um, anybody, everybody felt like they were running away from them. It was like a stigma just saying that you have or testing positive for COVID-19. So she really felt really pain. And honestly, that really affected me as well because you never really know how um, African immigrants live, right? Because they come from a place where everybody is together. I mean, to see your friend, you don't even have to make an appointment or call the person ahead of time. You just walk over to the person's house or go just visit the person without any form of prior notification. So having to just be alone with just you and then you're sick and nobody can come to see you, it was really, it was really, really tough on them. So many of them um, felt affected by the loneliness and their solution. Um, some of them even responded to how they were very happy we even created this forum, right? Um, the forum gave them an opportunity to meet, even though it was online, at least they were still able to see other people in their community. They made new friends. They were talking about keeping up the sessions just so that they can be checking up on each other. And they're even using the opportunity to also you know, talk about issues that are important to them too during the pandemic. So it was really, really, it was a very moving session for all three sessions in all the states. And um, I really feel we should, as a community, both um, everyone attending the session right now and we that are still working on the project to find a way to you know, maintain that engagement that African community members feel because that really helps them as they go through issues in their different, at their different levels. Thank you. Yeah. Chioma? No, I have to I have to agree with my with my colleagues were saying. Um, and I want to emphasize what Agatha just said in terms of even creating this space was a relief, right? That people were excited to be a part of the project, but I would say, you know, maybe even more excited just to have a space where they can talk to people. Um, and we had groups that were very uh, community specific, right? So we had groups that majority, if not all of the participants were from, from Sudan or Somalia, right? And so they were able to, you know, speak in their own languages. They were able to laugh. They were able to talk about, you know, how's your family doing? How's your daughter doing? How's your husband doing? And so it allowed, we allowed for space for, pe for people to be in community before even getting in um, to sort of the research. And I think that supported the research being more authentic for our community, because we knew the importance of creating a, a, a space where people can just be and be with each other before we jump in, right? Um, majority of the leadership are African immigrants, are identified as first or second generation African immigrants. Um, even our, all of our community health workers um, are African immigrants. And so there was a familiarity there in terms of how, what is the best way to conduct this? I mean, you know, once we do more of our, our recommendations, you'll see we use WhatsApp a lot, right? Um, I think the go-to for researchers is just email, right? Not even text when we come to participants, but we use WhatsApp a lot as a way to communicate with our community health workers, as a way for our community health workers communicate with our participants. And so just, you know, our, our team having that cultural knowledge was powerful to create a project where people just felt like they can just be and share and be vulnerable. Um, I was a part of one um, where, where one person was really, you know, to the point of emotionally like crying, right? Because of what they were going through. Um, and so creating that space or, or allowing for the space to be um, a community space, um, I think was was one of the most powerful. And even having this conversation actually is a reflection of that because I did not think about that. <laughs> but um, yeah, I really appreciate this conversation. And yeah, I feel that because, yeah, it, it sounds like the work that you did was very therapeutic for everyone that was engaged in it, right? It, it sustained, as Agatha talked about, this virtual community and people were just happy to be part of it. I wanna move on with other questions. We've People are asking questions around dissemination, in particular dissemination in non-traditional uh, ways beyond kind of peer-reviewed products. What have you been thinking about that? And, and what are some of the ideas that have been that have surfaced? Um, I think I, I would say that dissemination have already started because um, we, like in the state of Maine, I had opportunity to present this uh 
uh, this project in uh, several forums. Um, here in Maine, you have uh, the we have uh, some district public health councils. You know this, and uh, where I was able to present this uh, project at, and we also have uh, uh, the state refugee. Uh, the Special Refugee Coordinator and the State Refugee Health Coordinator have forums like uh, quarterly meetings and uh, semi-annual meetings where we were able to, I was able to talk about this uh, uh, project here. And uh, also uh, even recently, before coming to even this meeting, the main public health association uh, is uh, planning a conference. Uh, I am not going to present this time, but I think the last one, when there was a meeting about the conference, they, they, I mean, they heard about this project. So I would say that, you know, uh, from forums to forums, I think each state has been trying to have, uh, you know, a way of uh, disseminating this. And I think we, three of us were at a meeting for Rhode Island. Uh, our partners in Rhode Island organized, you know, uh, a conference where we were also able to present this. So these are the way for now that we are doing this, but I'm not sure if uh, my colleagues have other ideas that uh, we could probably disseminate this work. Other ideas or thoughts about dissemination? Well, we are in the con current conversation around dissemination for in other ways. Uh, one of the things that I've done in previous projects is use infographics as a way to report back to the community and as a way to create visibility and awareness and conversations used on social media or, or on WhatsApp what, and in WhatsApp groups. What app groups, whatever. So <laughs> I said it right before, but I think I'm tired now. Um, and so being able to create uh, user friendly, uh, readable, um, uh, materials is very critical, right? Um, I know several people talked about how we're we using this to do policy work, and I would love to have that conversation with a group of folks who are involved in, in policy work and really thinking about um, how do you make uh, this type of information applicable. Uh, we do have a couple of recommendations that are policy-based, right? So we have recommendations around immigrant-friendly policies, um, definitely geared more towards ensuring that um, a lot of the relief assistance that has been put out um, it, uh, gives space for people with different immigrant statuses um, to be able to access, right? We saw that in Massachusetts and we saw that across New England that people with certain immigrant statuses did not have access to um, some of the financial support. Um, they might be in, in um, uh, different housing situations. And so um, they are not able to um, get access to some of the relief, rental relief work, right? And so those are some of the policy recommendations. And Angela, thank you for posting that. Um, would love to connect with you um, and just reach out to us, please. Um, and so definitely um, really thinking about what are ways in which we can um, reach out to different stakeholders, just not researchers or providers, but policymakers. And I would love to hear people's ideas around that if people in this forum have some ideas around that. I want to acknowledge Julie and the group of 15 staff at the New York City, I think that's Department of Health and Minority Health are watching this webinar together. So hello and, and welcome from New York and want to acknowledge them because they had a lot of thoughts and comments here and uh, sharing testimonies from all from the individuals uh, saying that thanks for sharing these awe inspiring slides referencing the 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 uh, uh, photo voicing the vignettes they truly captured the emotion emotions of everyone felt during the pandemic right and and I think that point is well taken is that uh, irrespective of where we come from our country of origin uh, that people were feeling the same kind of experiences. So it really kind of like speaks to the humanity of, of, of so many people. And so I was thinking when we've been talking about this work in time and really kind of contextualizing this, I remember when I first uh, was, was in Boston uh, with you all talking about the planning of this work, I was kind of struck by uh, the number of African immigrants that live in the New England region. I, I wonder if 
and maybe you and uh, Chioma could kind of talk a little bit about that. Here I am sitting in North Carolina, and I just wasn't aware of that. So I'd love for you to kind of give us a little bit of backstory about that to help contextualize that. And also the use of WhatsApp, that was not something that I was familiar with. Um, but uh, I'd love to hear from you about that. Please share. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, if you see even in this project, if you go on our website, uh, the part the part that uh, Agatha presented, you will see the demographics data where you will see that uh, in the New England era, we have a lot of African immigrants from a lot of different African countries. We have people from Senegal, Liberia, Nigeria, uh, Sierra Leone. We have also people from uh, Congo. Congolese have uh, been uh, flocking in in the most recent uh, years as refugees and asylum seekers. In many, you have Angolan people from the from Angola. You have a lot of people from uh, Congo that have been resettled as refugee here in Maine. You have people from Somalia, from Sudan, and uh, also a uh, few people from uh, you know uh, the. Um, uh, Morocco and uh, you know the, I would say this uh, the Maghreb part of Africa where the, the white part of Africa you have uh, uh, people from Morocco few people from Egypt that I know here that lives here in Maine so um, yes you know New England is a white I mean region but you know recently we have seen you know a lot of uh, African immigrant coming to our shores and. Um, Yes, it wasn't difficult for me to, to reach out to the population because of the work I do. And uh, also it was even easier when I included some uh, uh, community health workers from uh, Sudan as well, from Sudan and Somalia that help reach out to the population. We got, a, we got a people mostly from Congo, uh, Djibouti and uh, Somalia here in the state of Maine. So I'm not sure about, um, uh, and also people from uh, Rwanda as well, Rwanda uh, as well that we we got because we have we have people that speak Swahili. We have to use interpreters and, uh, to, to to help us uh, and do that. So yes, uh, when we're talking about this, you know, um, one may think that well, uh, New England is you know mostly white. How are we gonna get that? But yes, New England has been uh, a destination. Uh, for a lot of African immigrants recently. And uh, we do find them in most of the states. Now, just to expand on what Enzo was saying, um, I think there's a myth also around who are the individuals migrating? Who are the African immigrants migrating? We do have a significant number of refugees, but the majority of African immigrants that migrate are actually of other statuses, right? They're migrating uh, based on student um, statuses, uh, fiance statuses, they're migrating for work. Um, and I think that's just a general misconception uh, around the narrative of immigrants, period. <laughs> but particularly for African immigrants, understanding that folks are coming for work, right? Folks are coming for reasons. And even as refugees, folks are coming for reasons, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because they're not, they're not able to live stable lives in their home countries. Um, and we can talk about the global polit political mm -hmm. Uh, narrative around that, but I'm not going to go into that. <laughs> um, and so we have people here who represent a very wide range, right? Um, but, you know, when, when we think about this community, we definitely have to think about language, right, as a key component of diversity and culture as a key component of diversity and immigration status as a key component of, of diversity. Um, and just because someone comes over who has a certain level of education, right? A certain level, you know, with a master's or a PhD, doesn't mean they're not gonna have challenges in the healthcare system. There's another study that I've done around health literacy in African immigrants. And what we found is people, uh, African immigrants of high education um, level have low health literacy, meaning they have challenges accessing the healthcare system take using information that's provided to them to make informed decisions or navigate the healthcare system. So it's not even necessarily about education level, how smart we are, right? It's really about 
um, how broken the healthcare system is and supporting people with different languages, different cultures, different immigration statuses and engaging and utilizing services. Thank you. I mean, there are some comments in the, in the chat box that really kind of highlight just that. I wanna uh, acknowledge comfort um, conference says, I want to connect with others who are doing research. Angela, thank you for placing uh, your manuscript there and sharing that with us um, as well. And we have people from all over the U.S. that are engaged in this work. Um, one of the comments was like, you know, what do you feel um, at this moment, you know, around different states are responding kind of differently to immigration issues, right? And, and support for refugees. Um, what, what more could be done in your opinion, just even just based on the uh, feedback and the recommendations that you have around uh, kind of being more welcoming and accommodating of, of individuals uh, who, are, who are asylum seekers, who are immigrants, others? And so I think I think you, it would be interesting to hear your thoughts around that, especially given where you sit um, in the state agency. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, different states um, have a, a different policy, or uh, maybe uh, maybe have a, a level of uh, a different level of. African immigrant friendly attitude that may impact maybe resources that are available for the African immigrant, you know. Um, and uh, maybe this is where I would say uh, organizations such as uh, P. Curry or anybody, you know, interested in African immigrant health or in African immigrant research should probably uh, direct some of their resources to, uh, being that they are like a national, uh, national resource. So um, you're right. I mean, it's, 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 it's very difficult to access and to have to put resources at the African immigrant disposal when you are in an environment where uh, this uh, demographic is not really uh, the priority of the policy makers. So, I mean, that's really difficult to address, uh, but I believe that there are some private sources or private resources that people can probably um, use that metrics, you know, to see which state and which part of, you know, the country where we have this immigrant and then the environment is not as friendly and as, res as respective, uh, receptive of them, maybe to direct the resources in those area. Yeah. Thank you. As we wrap up today, I wonder, Chiom, if you would, kind of provide some additional comments around PCORI and their interest in similar projects like this. You started out with that and I was really impressed by it. I wanna acknowledge that Community Campus Partnerships for Health has a uh, Eugene Washington Community uh, Patient Engagement Award as well, uh, entitled At the Heart of the Matter, where we are conducting a series of of virtual convenings with historically black colleges and universities in the Southeast region of the US. and and, and Chioma's opening comments made me think about how receptive actually PCORI has been to this project and similar ones that have really um, allowed us to work in new or different populations and communities uh, and surface issues that really otherwise would not have even been addressed. Um, and so Chioma, I, I wonder if you have some additional comments about that. Um, around PCORI as a possible funding source for many of the individuals who are on this call today? Um, one, I want to say CCPH is a resource. So I'll do that um, in terms of- CCPH is a resource, I said. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I want to really encourage people to um, think about PCORI as a funding mechanism. They have um, their next- uh, funding cycle for engagement awards is in the spring. Um, they actually have uh, their process that you first have to submit a letter of intent. And then if you're invited, then you submit a full proposal. And actually a letter of intent is due Friday. Now people who are okay with not sleeping for the next couple of days, 
go for it, okay? But um, it also, you know, requires you to really think about, again, having what they call patient partners, okay? Patient, basically community members, those of us who do community participatory research, which I saw a lot of comments in the, in the chat, basically means that you have community folks at the table, right? And community folks can be actual individuals or it could be organizations that represent individuals. So advocacy organizations, ethnic-based organizations, um, like Inza mentioned, some of our partners are refugee organizations. Um, and so you wanna make sure you have your leadership team reflective of and are inclusive of patient, what they call patient partners, okay? Um, and then you want to make sure that you have an understanding of what PCORI is looking for. PCORI is interested in patient-centered outcomes or patient-centered research. Research that supports patients in making informed decisions on their um, health care, right? Research that helps inform clinical interventions, all right? Um, and so they have an amazing mechanism, our amazing staff and team there as part of their engagement awards. So you can actually email them, schedule what they call, I think they call it like a dis discovery call, or you can schedule a call with them and discuss with them your idea for the project, right? And they will give you some insight on directions that you can go, all right? So there are mechanisms in which you can get more information about PCORI, like I said, CCPH, or you can go on PCORI's website, reach out to one of their project officers that's a part of the engagement awards, keywords, engagement awards, and ask for a meeting in preparation for submitting a letter of intent in the spring, okay? I think and, uh, and Chioma, it's just that the operative word is engagement. That's what you want to focus on. This is not research. This is really about engagement. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's the point that we've really been trying to drive home is who do you want to engage with? That group, those individuals, organizations need to be patients uh, and need to include patients. They're part of the stakeholders, but there are other groups and, and what they call stakeholders that they're very much interested in as well. So um, please consider that as a funding option um, uh, for you and your organization. I wanna thank all of our panelists today for the work that you've done and for um, sharing personally and professionally with us. I think that um, an indication of a really excellent webinar is always how many people stay online. Uh, and we've been at it for almost an hour and a half and people have stayed with us because it's been so powerful and it's been so impactful. And so many people continue to chat in about how uh, excited they are. And I think many of them are just excited that someone is, the importance of being seen and the importance of being heard. And that's what this project really to me highlights is, is those two elements making the invisible visible. Um, people are not invisible. They're very much there. They're just overlooked. And this project really has really brought that to surface. So I think that's important. I wanna encourage you to visit the website of ccphealth.org. We are a website that, on our website of resources, and we are a resource to you. Visit pakori.org and also find out more about the African immigrant a project by, uh, I want to make sure I do that correctly, africanimmigranthealth.org. Is that right? Yes, africanimmigranthealth.org. Go there. Don't crash the system yet, um, but visit their website and find out more about them. Again, I want to thank all of our panelists and for you joining us. Give us a few days to place this on our website um, and you can share this with others and have a watching party, right? Ah, that would be great. And, but share with Chioma how you're using this information. We want to know the difference that this is making in your life and in your professional work. I'm Al Richmond, Executive Director of Community Campus Partnerships for Health, located in Research Triangle Park, North Carolina. Thank you for joining us and have a wonderful day.